In the past, on the VPUB, we've compared old whiskies to new whiskies, old versus now, and comparing, you know, antique bottles, old expressions and additions against their contemporary releases. That's not what we're going to be talking about tonight. That's not what we're going to be doing tonight. Tonight, instead, what we're going to be focusing on is the organic element in our and uh, the way that we look at whiskey and whiskey's progression, how much our own individual personal experiences are maybe forcibly applied to that whole landscape. That's what we're going to look at tonight. I'm going to share some stories with you. I'm going to uncork a couple of interesting bottles that are nostalgic to me or potentially could be and talk about how, especially for people coming into whiskey now, the worst thing you can probably tell them is how good whiskey perhaps used to be. I'll see you in a second. Hello, whiskey folk. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the VPUB. Welcome to Thursday nights. Amazing to be able to hang out with you for another wee Thursday night. Uh, get our whiskey geekery on. Is that Eric? Wait, I saw him tonight. Fantastic. Um, yeah, been looking forward to it. Uh, always look forward to my Thursday nights as well. Uh, the last couple of VPUBs, um, me recovering post-COVID, I suppose, has just been kind of uh, solo sessions. Uh, next week is a remote session. I'll be up on the Isle of Rassi. It's going to be an interesting thing and quite an interesting thing to consider, actually, on the back of tonight's topic you know, kind of looking back on whiskey's progression over the years and our relationship with it, and then versus a super exciting future that we have with whiskey going forward. Um, we've also got uh, some guests coming in as well uh, in the future. Uh, I know that a lot of you are pestering me about Roddy. We have spoken, and uh, he's absolutely up for it. Uh, we've just got to sort out, uh, synchronise a date and sort out uh, a topic that we can both enjoy of I sent over a wee suggestion to him and they will see if we can get that sorted sooner rather than later. It's wonderful to see that you're excited to get Roddy back again. And uh, for me, you know how much I like to hang out with Roddy, so we'll make that happen. And then industry guests and things like that plotted throughout May, June, as we run into the inevitable uh, summer shutdown. Anyway, I hope you're all doing very well. Uh, I'll get on to the topic in a wee minute, but I think uh, we're going to try, we're going to genuinely try and keep things neat tonight. I, I can't remember the last time we managed to keep the VPUB under that two hour mark. You constantly tell me it doesn't matter. You constantly tell me you don't care, but you know, just, just let's see if we can do it tonight. It's just me. <laughs> Surely I'm able to keep it a wee bit neater tonight. Let's jump in to the lounge and welcome some of you beautiful whiskey folk and dedicated barflies before we get all misty eyed and nostalgic over our whiskies tonight. I've actually been sipping, oops, three whiskies. I've had to cover them up because they absolutely filled the room with uh, peaty, heady aromas. Uh, I've got uh, three different Lagavulin 12 cast strengths, and I'll talk to you about them in a second. My original, uh, the one that really got me singing the praises of Lagavulin, um, I've got a bottle of it here that's not getting opened because it's too expensive to replace now. It's getting kept. But I've got a wee sample bottle here uh, that I was able to use, um, uh, 2017 56.5% ABV. And I've also got a wee sample here from my pal Shane Whiskey Lock. Uh, down at, uh, from his channel, he sent me a, a sample of the 56.5% uh, out of pure coincidence, uh, 2021 release as well. Uh, and I've also put it up against uh, the one that I bought for a recent VPUB, which Shane was involved in. Uh, this is the 2022 release as well. And I've been sipping backwards and forwards with these. And I'll kind of give you my take on them. Uh, and I'll tell you a wee story about the, my relationship with Lagavulin 12 after I've welcomed some of you guys in. Wonderful. So amazing to see you all. Knocking on for 250 of you in already. Um, superb to see you all here and excited this early in the stream, especially as the lights are, are kind of, or the daylight in the Northern Hemisphere at least, is a bit longer and it's starting to feel like spring is in the air. And a kind of whiskey season takes a wee bit of a back seat, I feel. Uh, but it's amazing to have you all. Uh, Eric Waite is here and he's bought me a dram. You superstar, Eric. was thinking about you recently, my friend. Uh, I hope you're doing well. And I think I do 
feel like I owe you a reply to something. 79 days and I'll be back home in Scotland. Ah, there you go. I think that that's what you've been talking about. So you're coming over. Uh, I think, do you not land here in July during my holidays? Anyway, buddy, thank you very much for your your, your dram. You're a superstar. And uh, let's take a wee sip of this Lagavulin and raise a glass to Eric Way, everyone. Thank you very much for your dram, buddy. Maybe we'll get a chance to hook up. Cheers. 79 days, that's What's that, two and a half months? Jimmy Legacy, nah, I don't like that Roddy fella. <laughs> Roddy's looking forward to seeing you too, Jimmy. Uh, wonderful to have you in, buddy. I hope you're doing well. And Jimmy Legg has also bought me a drama. He's saying, why would we want this ever to be over? That's crazy talk. Thank you very much, buddy. Uh, but I think, I don't know, I just feel like we always used to have this kind of two-hour thing and occasionally it would slip over. It became a bit of a joke. And then now it's just... Yeah, it's always two hours, 20 minutes. It's always two hours, 15. If you don't care, you don't care. It's fine. It just, it's the V-pub. You know, we're, we're not rushing. It's not typical whiskey content. We're just, it, it takes as long as it takes. Uh, some people find the delivery a wee bit tedious and a wee bit slow. I, I'm just, the way I want to approach whiskey, the way I want to share it with you is going to be a wee bit different from a lot of the YouTube content that's out there. There's fabulous channels coming all the time and the channels that are already there are building their content and making it better all the time and most of it generally speaking is kind of um you know quite bite-sized well-edited compact uh, instant grab information really really good quality stuff there's one i'm going to talk about later tonight actually whiskey diary ben um it's brilliant content it really is so i can either just compete with that or get involved with that get or i can just do what I enjoy, which is this, <laughs> hanging out with you. It's not, it doesn't suit everyone and that's okay. But if it is your first time, you stick with it. And say hello in the chat, tell people what you're drinking or where you're from. If you're watching on the replay, thank you very, very much. Leave a little comment and things and I'll do my very best to interact with you there. It's so much more about being like a virtual pub environment and it's so much more about the community and all of that wonderful stuff. Another wee dram come in here as well. I don't want to miss that. Uh, it's from a pal, Justin. Uh, Justin, good to see you. Good evening, Roy. I'd like to welcome my friend Tony in. Not sure if it's too late for him, but if he's not promised, uh, you'll catch it on the replay. Fantastic. Let's raise a wee glass uh, to say thanks to Justin for his dram and to say hello to his pal, Tony, and say, Tony, welcome. Put your feet up, pour a wee dram, and I hope you enjoy hanging out here. Cheers, buddy. Cheers, Justin. A recent patron came on, actually. And mentioned that they hadn't really got involved in the chat much in the comments or the live chat and they were kind of they felt like maybe because it's the same names that come up a lot of the time and they feel like it's a kind of a cliquey atmosphere let me reassure everyone that's out there consider them taking your first steps into interacting with people in the whiskey community out there that is absolutely the opposite of that it is literally the most welcoming space i've known in my life it is the, the people are utterly kind. I don't witness much in the way of snobbery in this chat ever. I only see welcoming kindness. So please don't think that it's a closed or cliquey or anything like that. Please just relax and enjoy being part of the, the VPUB chat. Whiskey Vault is here saying, keeping it neat, Aquavitae, no need. We can just add some water, or in this case, minutes, to the VPUB for some extra flavour. I, I love the analogy. Whiskey Vault, great to have you in as well. Jimmy, like, again, saying that they find it tedious and slow. They're not reading the chat. I agree with you, Jimmy. When I come back in and I do the timestamps or the comments and I start to get involved in the chat, some of the comments that I miss every single week, is they're just gold. What's really heartbreaking is sometimes I miss, I've spotted people, old friends and new that have dropped in and I miss them and I'm, it makes me a wee bit sad that I never had a chance eh, to, to shout them out. Eh, uh, Al Young is saying, Aquavite, enjoying a drama like Lafroy quarter cask given to me by my son on my birthday. Brilliant, Al. You've got a good son. You've nurtured him very, very well. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. I hope you're enjoying it. And a grain of malt is saying it really is. Even my wife commented today when I mentioned multiple whiskey folks sending me samples. How sharing and caring everyone seemed. Eh, whiskey peeps, it's jumped, my friend. I need to scroll back. There we go. Whiskey peeps are the best. They really are. I also think that what we do is because of if we stay positive and we stay welcoming and we stay kind and caring and sharing, it encourages more people to do the same. We have to preserve it because it's not like that everywhere all of the time, especially today. It, it makes us 
it's a good antidote to that feeling of nostalgia, that thing that makes us want the simpler times, the kinder times, the easier times, the days of the past. Well, when we get together here, we can we demonstrate that actually whiskey is fabulous at bringing good folk together who just want to get on with the now and really appreciate what we have today. There's a brilliant uh, conversation, a set, a set of comments that happened in Patreon. Uh, I, so I do a write-up every week on, on Patreon and a, a people comment immediately afterwards and it's fantastic comments, fantastic feedback. And it was very much about, about that. It was very much about you know, personal stories about connectedness, about the thing that whiskey has afforded us, the space that whiskey has brought us into. We, ne we never imagined that. We just wanted to enjoy the drink. And we suddenly find ourselves in company that, that even when whiskey's taken a back seat, we're very happy and we're buoyed by fellowship, companionship, connectedness, just feeling like we're in good company and friends. Uh, the Glen Wivis folk have reached out to me to get involved in their blog. And they've sent through a lot of questions. It's very, very, they obviously, they understand what the VPUB is and it's very focused about the VPUB. Um, so I'm going to get a chance to hopefully write at length about that and I'll obviously share it with folk if it, if it does actually ever get published. Sorry, I should be welcoming you guys in. Uh, uh, I'll scroll back up a wee bit. I'm always trying to catch orange. So if you're trying to get my attention, it's highlighted orange when you type at Aquavite or just Aquavite. David Owen is in. He's saying, Evening Roy, at last I can catch a VPUB live. Good for you. I've also, David, been looking for a pal of mine, Mark Goins, who's usually quite a few hours behind. He doesn't always catch it live, but he is actually in Scotland. And I got to hang out with Mark, Donnie. Uh, Rick and Quinn, his buddies, and he's got more buddies, Brady and other folk joining him this week, and they're doing a, a trip, travel around Scotland. But just to be sitting in the pot stall with Mark was a little bit surreal. I've only ever seen Mark, I've, I think I've seen him three times over in Texas, but the fact he's made the pilgrimage over here. Mark Goins, by the way, everyone, is the guy who uh, commissioned the VPUB compass, that solid hardware that weighs a ton, that thing, and he sent it over, to, it just arrived in the mail one day, and He's a star. He's just a great guy. I uh, hope he's not falling asleep and he's still in. Harrow is here. Whiskey Weekend Drammy saying, the older Black Bottle 10 was amazing. Uh, too, ba too bad not that much on auction. Interesting, Harrow. So you're a lover of the old Black Bottle 10 and you find it better than the modern expressions of Black Bottle 10. Black Bottle 10. You're not alone in that. But you are, because of your love of that older bottle, because of the connections and the time that you've had with it, you're cruising the auctions to try and pick up an older Black Bottle 10, there's not a lot of it around. Maybe people don't think that there's much value in it, and truthfully, there probably isn't in it. So, you know, people tend not to be very uh, motivated to punt it on auction. We're going to talk more about that tonight. It's super interesting. Whiskey Vault said, just uncorked a Chapter 7 Isla Malt, eight-year-old, uh, first fill bourbon cast, probably quite some similarities with the elements of Isla from last week. Aquaviti sounds like it, Whiskey Vault. It uh, looks like it'll be a good one as well. Fantastic. I uh, hope you're enjoying it. Good chance it's going to be Kalila, right? But you never know. Could be Lefroy, maybe a Bamor, maybe a P.T. Bura. Could be quite a few things. Um, but as long as it's good Isla whiskey, does it really matter where it's from. Fantastic to see so many of you and I've just caught Stefan Novak is in tonight. So let's everybody raise a wee glass to my friend Stefan who celebrated a, a very big birthday this week. Uh, my, uh, he's a star. I've managed to hang out with him a few times. He's regularly in the V-Pub. He's a lovely whiskey gentleman and uh, I want to raise this glass and say, Stefan, many happy returns my friend. Happy birthday to you buddy. Cheers. Josh Pence has bought me a wee dram to say got to buy a dram anytime I can catch a VPUB live. You star, Josh. Thank you so much for buying me a dram anytime. And uh, just being here, just catching it live or on the replay, buddy. Cheers to you, Josh. Thank you very much. I need to go easy here. These are three cast strength drams. I need to pour something else to talk about nostalgia. Let's get the story started. Because I think what we'll do is we'll park the Lagavulin. And I'll finish this wee three Lagavulin comparison towards the end of the stream and then after I've killed the stream tonight. Well, let's go into something a wee bit lighter. I'm going to pour a wee bottle of Anok 16. Not much of a pop there. This has been opened a wee while now. I'm a wee bit careful with this because it's long discontinued, like so many whiskies are. And for me, it's always been one of those wee treat 
favourite drams. It's not the type of thing that you could pour for somebody and they'd go, oh, Roy, I see what you get. This is amazing whiskey, amazing whiskey. There's a lot of subtlety here. But this was a very important whiskey for me on my, let's say, nostalgia journey. I'll put it off to the side for a second because I want to raise a glass and say happy birthday to somebody else before I forget. And on Saturday, eh, one of our dear friends, one of the longest eh, barflies, in fact, you might even call him the original barfly because he literally created the Aquavite Barflies Facebook group and he's celebrating a birthday on Saturday. I'm, of course, I'm talking about Rolf. I'm talking about Ebhead. I'm talking about, I think he was once known as Whiskey Wolf and all sorts of other things. I'm talking about my pal Rolfie. His birthday is coming up on Saturday. So, Rolfie, many happy returns to you and a huge thanks to Menno, who's always very good at pointing out the birthdays, just to make sure I don't miss any. Happy birthday, Rolfie. Cheers, Menno. Mmm... Okay, ah, it's so good. It's so good. Scotch and Bayou Lan is insane. We opened one of those when I was there. So great. Is that the Anok 16? Did I open it when you were here? Amazing. You probably heard me rant about it back then, Leanne and Jimmy Legacy. And if I can't get another, I have a terrible time opening a whiskey. Terrible time. I know what you mean. I've demonstrated that to you tonight. We've got this Lagavulin 12. This, this is available. There's lots of this available, Jimmy. However, the price has now slipped beyond what I'm willing to pay for it. So that becomes something that I'm just going to park and it'll be, they'll be at the right moment to open that whiskey. And I'm fortunate that I've got other ones on the go as well, just now that makes it a wee bit easier. And I had a wee sample put aside from the last bottle. I think I must have put that aside when I was doing a recycled review or something, but it was sitting there next to Lagavulin's. I was very uh, grateful to be able to have it. So... I guess the story that I'll start with is the Lagavulin story while I let them sit and rest. Many of you might have come to the channel through some of the original videos that I did way back when and you know there's not some of them have aged okay some of them haven't aged very well at all and one of the ones that I did back in I think 2018 or something like that was the top five in my top five whiskies of all time the things that really kind of set my wee whiskey path alight back in 2018 and also the top five more available ones because I'm always kind of I've always been mindful of, of about things that people can actually get and afford there was Lagavulin was a thread throughout those two videos uh, the eight appeared the 16 definitely appeared and the 12 year old cast strength appeared and the cast strength 12 year old was one that was a wee bit ambivalent about typically I tried them by the dram. I think the only bottle I ever bought, now in my mind it's a 2014, but it could be a 2013 release. And I bought it and I thought, eh, it's, it's, it's okay. There were so many other uh, whiskies that, that I was enjoying more. Anyway, as time goes on, you visit Lagavulin, you start to understand Lagavulin a wee bit more, you start to sip from the warehouse casks and all of these things. And all the while you're building this relationship with a distillery, you're building that sense of, of a bond with a distillery, with where they make that whiskey and the style of whiskey that they make, and you grow to love it. Eventually, in 2017, eh, I get to try the 2017 release of Lagavulin 12 Cast Strength. Now, I hadn't bought it because I was in a huff that not only was I not in love with the 12 Cast Strength at the time, but I also felt that the price jumped from about £70 to about, I think it was £90 or £95, something like that. It doesn't, with the benefit of hindsight, it doesn't seem like a big jump. But back then, 2017, 2016, 2015, that was a big jump. That was a huge jump and enough for me to say, no, I'm not interested in that. But that 2017, I immediately went out and bought a bottle and I've got through maybe four or five bottles of that 2017 because it connected with me so much. It took me right back to the Lagavulin. It took me right back to the Lagavulin warehouse tasting. It was that lovely kind of lime and lemon, almost like an effervescence to it. It was the creaminess. It was the icing sugar thing that I sometimes get in, and this the that kind of sweet peat element that you can get in Lagavulin. The elegance of it, despite this being this big, bold, you know, heavily peated whiskey, there's just this elegance to it, and I absolutely loved it. For me, it was the best Lagavulin forever uh, the best like the best 12 cast strength certainly 
and I was just in love with it, and I, sh and I shouted about it. And most of the people that picked it up seemed to enjoy it too. As the years ticked by, I obviously started to compare it directly to 2014s and 2012s and 2015s and various other 12-year-old uh, cast strength releases, only to discover that while there are differences, the idea that the 2017 was elevated much, much better in, in terms of an experience was really me. <laughs> it was the organic part of that experience that was making it better. It was the profile and the flavor of that particular 2017-year-old expression. And it wasn't necessarily much better than the 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016, whatever. For me, it was. Only for me. Because of my experiences with Lagavulin, because of my preferences and style of whiskey. So that is what elevated that experience. That's what brought me so close to the side of Lagavulin, and especially in the 12-year-old cast strength. And of course, every time I recall that moment, that epiphany when I sipped that 2017 and just thought, this is fabulous, it's amazing whiskey. Every time I think about it, it's amplified each time. And every time I pour a wee glass of the 2017, I'm hoping that I can relive that amazing, lights on, bright, wonderful, visceral moment. And there I am in sipping the Lagavulin again, though that's that's all I have left without opening a new bottle. So I need to be precious about it, and I'll sip it a bit later. So clearly, this is very much down to a very subjective, a very personal, a, a very a, a very subjective individual story, let's say, an individual whiskey journey. Everyone is going to come into whiskey and have their own epiphanies, their own moments, their own wonderful whiskies that's going to, colour their whiskey journey, whether you've been into whiskey for decades, just the recent few years, or whether you're coming into whiskey now, these experiences are always going to be there. They're always going to be there. Each time, because of how transient whiskey is, like as Jimmy said, he's got a terrible time opening a new one because he knows it might be difficult to replace. Because of how transient these things are, it's a batch made product, and they're always trying to switch it up and make it new and they run out of stock and they're trying to develop things and, and all of this, it means that inevitably there are regular, uh, either special or limited editions or regular discontinuations. It's just the way of it. So we roll with it and we move forward and we ex ex excitedly explore the new stuff that's coming along. But if, you've, if you're coming into whiskey now and it's tiresome for you to, we've got a guy that writes for us uh, on Dramface, fantastic guy, fantastic writer, Doogie Crystal. And one of his things is that he, one of the things he doesn't like to hear is now that he's discovered whiskey, he doesn't like to hear about the whiskey that's gone for him, the whiskey that he can't touch or connect with anymore, the whiskey of the past. And he hates to hear how that whiskey used to be so much better. Because even if that, that's factually true, even if that is correct, it's no use to Doogie Crystal and it's no good to all of Doogie's peers and compatriots that's coming into whiskey in very, very recent years. Because that whiskey of yesteryear, especially the legendary stuff and the stuff that's held high, is long gone. I want to talk to the Doogie Crystals of the world who feel like that tonight. Everybody will be able to take something from this. But I'm hopefully going to take you through my sto my little stepping stones that inspire nostalgia in me. Inspire, is that the right word? That create nostalgia in me. Look at those whiskies and then look at some whiskies that we can buy today that where we can taste the whiskies of the past and where we can kind of touch on those things that have created nostalgia in other people suddenly feels like a lot to get in the next two hours. Justin Wan is saying, same for me. It's not helpful for me to hear about the good whiskies of yesteryear. They're gone. Why not look forward to the likes of Arda Murkin and co? Spot on. Absolutely, Justin. And it can be both. 
Jimmy Legacy saying, I love to hear about all whiskey. If someone wants to talk to me, I'm all ears. I think that's why folk are here, Jimmy. Uh, over, what is 350 of you in here tonight hanging about just to talk to each other about whiskey. It's brilliant. And Mika is saying, my favourite Lager 12 cast strength is a 2004 release. Wow. So you're going to way back to potentially an early 90s uh, release. So let's just keep that in the fr in the frame, Mika. Let's just keep the, the 1990s in the frame because... The 1990s were a, a kind of golden era. Single malt was ramping up very, very quickly. People were getting interested. And I'm not speaking about worldwide markets getting interested. I'm speaking about invested enthusiasts. I'm speaking about, yes, whiskey geeks. However you want to refer to yourself, if you're connecting with a malt whiskey, you there's a good chance that you're aware of how much of a boost single malt whiskey got in the late 80s, throughout the 90s and in the 2000s. It was crazy. And what was crazy about it is that the stocks were often, not all the time, but the stocks were often deep. And it's true to say that malt whiskey, precious malt whiskey, was often undersold back then. So the prices were very, very cheap. Too cheap, arguably too, too cheap for a lot of examples. Now, it's overcorrected, of course, but we're not going to dwell too much on that tonight. We are going to just consider how things were in the 1990s. So that was made in the early 1990s, a 2004 release. Fantastic. And you're saying that that is a wonder if you took that 2004 release and compared it to a much more recent release of Lagerville and 12 cast strength. No doubt it would be different, just as these three in front of me are different, subtly different tonight. It would be different, but would it be objectively better? Would a room full of people hold the 2004 release high and say this is clearly the much better whiskey? In my experience, it tends to split room. It tends to be that, you know, it's, it's so, so, so subjective. And I think, Mika, maybe the reason that 2004 is your favourite is because of the impact and the moment and the time that you had. I'll maybe even guess that maybe the 2004 release was maybe one of your early Lagavulin 12 cast trends, but maybe not. TF is saying, for me, the bottles I'm nostalgic about are the ones that come with great memories, such as that bottle of Johnny Walker, which was the first whiskey I shared with my dad. This is exactly what I want to, to talk about tonight, TF. Perfect and on point. And Chester, you always saying, I had my epiphany with a now discontinued Lefroy 10 cast strength batch. It's not everyone's favourite, but this, exactly, it's not everyone's, it's definitely yours. But he's saying this particular batch somehow clicked with me personally, and I'm lucky to have backups. So isn't it interesting, you know, if when you read reviews on or he, you hear or watch reviews on whiskey or whatever, that you, we always are very, very aware that it's very subjective and there's a personal uh, edge to all of these things. And it's it's really nice to kind of understand or know where people are in their journey. So if you're listening to somebody like Ralphie, who's been drinking whiskey for decades, then you know his journey is much more complex. Whereas if you're listening to someone that's been uh, interested in getting into whiskey in very recent times, you know that that's a completely different perspective. Both are absolutely valid. Because you might find it much easier to connect with somebody who's much, depending on where you are in your journey, somebody who's much uh, newer to the whiskey uh, experience side of things, rather than somebody who is reaching and uh, on a lot of, and relying on a lot of experience and, and leaning on a lot of nostalgia and nostalgic experiences. Tommy Elmer is saying, tell the stories, but don't downplay the current version unless they've just fallen off the train. Uh, uh, so perhaps he's just talking, talk, speaking in general, uh, but certainly that's not the case so far on these uh, three Lager villains. I'm gonna to get to it in the end. There's differences here and it's interesting uh, to set them say beside. I need to remember to get to those. Anyway, let me tell you about this wee Anok. TF was talking about personal experiences here. When I got into this Anok, it's difficult for me to know for sure, but I believe it to be one of the bottles that made me realise that bourbon cask maturation was going to be my jam. <laughs> it was going to be my thing. I just loved the flavour from this. I love the freshness from it. The Anok 16 was a whisky that I discovered alongside my whiskey buddy of that time. He's still my whiskey buddy now, but he just lives a lot further away, the whiskey ref. We discovered this together. But I seem to recall that this was one that we would only 
poor for ourselves, not because we were precious about it or greedy with it or we didn't want to share it, but because it was subtle. So the ones that we were pouring for other folk when we wanted other people to try and enjoy whiskies tended to be uh, much more extreme, much more of a hook, much more powerful or potent. This was always that clean, super stone fruit, sweet, lovely, gentle, floral, delicious, ex-bourbon cask, refill cask, delicate thing, right in the sweet spot of age, 16 years old, perfect. It was just wonderful, wonderful stuff. And then Anok, because of stock, honestly speaking, Anok Do Distillery, discontinued it. It's just so, so good. Is it nostalgia that's making this whiskey good for me? No, this is objectively good whiskey. I'm certain of it. I'm so sure of it. But it's that peaches, it's that tinned tropical fruit, that lovely creamy style of delicate whiskey. It's just so compelling. And we're not, this isn't relying on kind of decades in a refill cask. This has still got quite bright vibrance to it. It's at that lovely, lovely age. As I say, Derek, wait, he's bought me another dram. Derek, you star, what are you doing? He said, I think I'm more nostalgic about whiskey experience such as standing on the pier at Boonahaven, walking the gardens of Glen Grant, taking the ferry over to Orkney or meeting MBs in Austin, Texas. Buddy, I think that that's what I absolutely hope to draw attention to tonight. Thank you very much for your dram as well, Eric. Cheers to you. I'll tell you, that my memory of Anok 16 when I sip it. Now, I know that Roddy loves Anok 16. It's one of his favourites too. I know other people out there that go, Anok 16, I know, I get it. I know what you talk about. The The auction prices for Anok 16 are like this. It's up and down and up and down and all over the place. But if you're interested in picking this up, you can pick it up for not much more than it retailed for when it was available. I think it was about £55, £60, maybe something about that. You can pick it up as low as 70 You might need to pay... It might break triple figures down again, dependent. It doesn't really appear often in auctions. But there are places out there in the retail space that has dusties of Anok 16 sitting on the shelf right now, um, ready, waiting for somebody to pick it up at retail, hopefully at retail. And it's just, it's glorious whiskey, and I really hope that Noctu can bring this back at some point in the future or a similar expression. This is very much a nostalgic whiskey to me because of the, the epiphany I had with the style of whiskey it was and because of the way I discovered it, sipping it on, at my kitchen breakfast bar with my buddy, the Whiskey Rev. It'll always be a wee glass of memories for me. I think now that I sip it tonight, it's tasting fabulous, even on the back of those Lagavulin 12s. There, there will always be a huge dollop of nostalgia. And I'll always want to try and keep a wee bottle of it on the shelf, as tough as that may be as time goes on. Ian Bruce is saying, sometimes the thought of nostalgia can blinker our perception or fog the acceptance of newer whiskey. That's absolutely my point. Exactly that, Ian. Exactly that. Um, the more I think that we can be aware of nostalgia, enjoy it, and remember and, and be grateful to have those because they, they were very real, you know, uh, vivid, uh, lucid moments that we had with those those whiskies, those moments, those environments like Glen, Glen Grant's Gardens for Eric or or uh, sipping with a, uh, somebody sipping a Johnny Walker with their, their dad, all, all of those things. But the more that we can be aware that that's the case and not let us start to become the boring old jaded guy who just talks about how everything's rubbish now and it used to be much better. Because that's a real danger. Rather than accept that, no, things were better back in the old days. Some things were not. Some things are better today. Even in the 1990s, what I'm going to be celebrating a lot tonight, the future of Scotch whiskey, nobody was sure. There were distilleries being shuttered in the 1990s, closed. Tullibardin completely shut. You'll notice that the, if you love your 20 and 25-year-old Tullibardins, they're gone now because there's no stock now to prop up 
uh, that release going forward. Glenn Cadam as well. We've lost the 18. We're, we're now losing the 21. And very soon in the future, we'll lose the 25 as well. Because and even in the 90s, as, as single malt was being successful, becoming successful again, distilleries were still struggling. There's, there's so much today that's better. And like I said at the opening, talking about can't it be both, I'm going to show you some examples of there are ways for it to be better today to enjoy the whiskies of the past. Let me get to that. Donald Pass is saying, hi, home from work, Roy. We'll watch this later. And I love the Anno. Good for you, Tim. Good to see you. Hope you're relaxed. I hope you're feeling good and it wasn't too hard a shift at work. And my pals, Kilted Moose is in saying, I almost bought that Anno 16, but at the time I was really into Pete. I bought an Ardbeg 10 instead. Then it was gone. A decision I've always regretted. Well, it's still available for you, buddy. And anytime you fancy a wee dram of it, there's plenty of it here for you, as you well know. Whiskey Weekend Dram is saying, and around the same price. Aye, Scotty S, good to see you in, Scotty. That's, my, that's our friend Scott uh, from Scotty's Drams. He's saying, eh, the Whiskey Rev, I just mentioned him to somebody locally today. Hello, by the way. Hello to you, Scotty. And uh, I don't know if the Whiskey Rev still picks up the V-Pub. Um, I think he's uh, maybe an occasional, uh, but he'll probably pick it up on the replay. Uh, a time for a drama saying congrats on the number one whiskey podcast that spent 10 minutes talking about how to start. <laughs> so uh, Gregor hosts uh, the Dram Face podcast and last week uh, it finally appeared again. Uh, it went out to uh, Dram Face members first and then on Monday, the start of this week, it went out publicly. Don't know where he's getting the number one podcast thing from, from but um, it was pretty fun and we had this kind of weird discussion about how we were just going to start the show. We were feeling quite rusty, I think. And rather than me edit that out like I normally would and clean it all up and make it, I just left the whole thing in. Uh, I hope it went down well. Whiskey Novice, Jim is here saying he's celebrating being a member of the Barflies for 37 months, he said. Ah, nostalgia. It's not what it used to be, eh? <laughs> exactly, Jim. Exactly. Perfectly summed up. Uh, missing a lot of the comments tonight. The chat is moving pretty, pretty fast. R Ebed Rolf is in. Good to see you, buddy. And Alistair Gray is saying, it's the Anarch 16 for you. For me, the original Glendronic revival. Such great memories. Aye, so you're talking about probably the original uh, Billy Walker Glendronic revival. In fact, there was a really early VPUB where the only subject I talked about, I think, in that VPUB uh, was just comparing a Billy Walker versus a newer version of it, Alistair. Uh, Alistair. A lot of people love it. Uh, Harrow's saying comment was about the old Pultney 12. Ah, the same for me with the salty note. I got you. Okay, a lot of people not happy with the current uh, old Pultney 12s. I get it. Uh, Jimmy, like I said, I was watching the Whiskey Devs Blues interview channel on YouTube, but I think it has stopped. Yeah, but if you can tune into Spaceside Radio, he, he has uh, at least once a week, he's still putting out a blues radio show on Spaceside Radio. Uh, and uh, he's still known as the Whiskey Rev. I don't know if they broadcast it digitally, but I can ask them and I'll drop a link for anybody that's interested. So that was the Whiskey Rev and I enjoying uh, Anok. We were also discovering at the time that we were getting into whiskey, as we were reading about whiskey, we are reading a lot. Um, I'd been sipping whiskey since 2005, but it was what was available to me, contemporary whiskey. And it took me a few years to start to study it and understand how whiskey had changed over the years and things. But when the Whiskey Rev and I got together, it was this kind of quickening. You know, we were really trying to explore as many whiskies as we could as fast as possible. And there was a legendary whiskey out there, a Longmorn 15-year-old. It was an original core release from Shivas Brothers. I think it was Shivas. Uh, Longmorn 15, bizarrely put out at 45% ABV, strange ABV with a modern looking at it with a modern lens but it became a legend and people loved this longmorn 15 year old people genuinely loved it and eventually it was made um obsolete it was discontinued i managed to pick up a bottle at auction uh, and we enjoyed it very very much at that time i also picked up the longmorn that replaced the 15 year old which was the longmorn 16 year old Everybody, for as long as you've been listening to me or watching the VPUB or anything, you've heard me talking about this. The Longmorn 16 today is a fabulous whiskey. You can still buy it today, but it's a bit pricey. There's an 18-year-old secret space side Longmorn that's also fabulous, and bizarrely a wee bit uh, better value in the UK market. But this original Longmorn 16 at 48% ABV was £49. Incredible value at the time, but we're not going to dwell on prices. 
talking about the experience and the moment, the thing that fires the nostalgia when I think about this whiskey. And it's the whiskey Rev and I again drinking these together. We had the 15-year-old and the 16-year-old and we're comparing them. His favourite was the 15. My favourite by far was this, this Longmorn 16. I've gone through, if somebody told me I'd gone through more than eight or nine bottles of this, I would believe them. Picking it up on auction when I can. Grabbing it from occasionally, bizarrely finding it occasionally on shelves. Not in recent years, but for a wee while you could still pick it up. This is still out there and it's still available. The price has shot away up to beyond £200 at auction a few years back. Um, I remember Alan, a whiskey friend, uh, passed me on one of his that he'd picked up at auction and he picked it up at the price he paid for it. He passed it on to me at the price he paid for it. Recently, this Longmorn 16 at auction is now back down to sub £100 again. These things are cyclical. And I think that you're going to hear me talking about nostalgia, but the takeaway message is going to be something a wee bit different tonight. Now, this bottle, as you can hear by that quite a puny little cork pop there, has been open a long time. Very precious with this, although I have got, I hope, I think I've got a backup bottle of this. So right on the back of the Anok, yeah, this is still super bright and super uh, fruity too, but on the back of the Anok, we've got um, a, a slightly richer edge to things. So it's almost like if you'd nose the two of them together, you're able to pick out a wee bit of sherry cask in the Longmorn, which is something that I wouldn't normally, if you were sipping it in isolation, the sherry cask would not be prominent. It's a very balanced whiskey. But I always get a lovely creamy, uh, and it's definitely stone fruit. It's a lot of similar uh, notes to the Anok, but it's creamy, it's richer. 48% ABV helps it. Now, this has been an open bottle a long time, but it's still bright enough. It's lovely chocolate. Softest of spice. Perfumed, lovely floral, sweet fruit. Everything is up at the top of the spectrum on the flavour notes. Not only the kind of bait, the foundation is there's a kind of creamy richness at the base, but all of the notes that you're getting are kind of high top notes. Uh, lovely peaches and cream. I used to always look for a note on this. It would remind me of kind of almost like peach yogurt and things like that, that creaminess and the peach working in together. Just a fabulously well put together, perfectly balanced, excellent whiskey. 16 years old, the sweet spot, 48% ABV, thank you very much. We don't know if it's naturally coloured and we don't know. We do know it's non-chill filtered because they've put that. This is Pernod Ricard. The Shivas brothers were talking about putting non-chill filtered in a the bottle. They don't do that in many. Tormor is another one that they do, but I think that's about it. Maybe an occasional Glenlivet release. But it's just wonderful, fantastic whiskey. And it's certainly something that's very nostalgic. Yes, the whiskey, but the time of us exploring it together and me discovering what I felt was this whole new, wonderful, sweet spot in Scotch whiskey. What about today? You're over £100 if you want to replace that with the current one today. Okay, maybe just a wee bit under £100. But you're at that order today. The 18-year-old is about £85, I think. The 16-year-old, I should have checked before, but I think it's getting on for it's 90 or 100 If you're I, If you've got an eye on the auctions and you're not in a hurry for it, and you've got a kind of little list of whiskies that you, you look for to see how they're doing on the auctions, remember the auctions ship internationally too. I'm not here to sell anything auction-wise. I think the point I'm getting at is that auction prices are softening sharper than you might be aware. The Lagavulins that I'm sipping tonight, you can pick up the Lagavulin 2017 for less than the contemporary retail releases of Lagavulin 12. That 2021, the one that Shane's given me a sample of, £135 Lagavulin 12 is, by the way, to buy at retail. 
you can pick that up at auction for 110. And there's a recent auction that ended at the start of this month where the 2022 release sold for £75. Somebody's losing money on this. Suddenly, I think what we're going to see is that there's not going to be the fervour. Of course, the Springbanks, the Glen Giles, the Kilcarens and things like that, the, the special limited releases stuff, the, the McAllens, that kind of thing is still going to have people clamouring for it. But what I am seeing now, the whiskey that I'm interested in, the whiskey that I'm nostalgic about, the things that get me excited and misty-eyed, they're coming back to me a wee bit. It's softening. Not for everything, not all of the time. But suddenly we are now in a position where we can say, oh, don't pay £135 on the contemporary one. If you, you've, you couldn't buy the 2017-year-old when it was out, but if you watch on auction, you'll get it cheaper than the contemporary one and you can try it. And there's going to be more examples of that throughout tonight. Justin Wan is saying someone's losing money, but it's probably not Diageo. I think that this is dangerous for all the producers out there. It's dangerous for all the auction sites. It's dangerous for everything. When this market softens, depending on how fast it does soften, it's very, very dangerous for anybody that's retailing whiskey to suddenly compete with the secondary market. And then if it's not interesting for people to buy these whiskies and make a little bit of money on them because the auction sites will ship internationally or because it's limited and it runs out quite quickly, whatever the reason is, if it suddenly becomes less and less lucrative or it's a loss-making thing, it stops immediately. And where does that impact? It impacts, of course, the primary sales. If the primary market starts to compete with the secondary market, it's a disaster. Let me give you the perfect example. Do not consider, I don't care how nostalgic you are about Talisker 18, at £175, you would be a fool to pay that money for that whiskey. It is not £175 worth of whiskey, and everybody in our community knows that. Go on to auction. And I struggle to find any bottle of Talisker 18 that's broken £120. Most of it is 100 or less. And in fact, the most recent auction that just ended, it was going for £80 and £90 a bottle. Half the price of retail. Worse than that, it's older expressions of Talisker 18, which if you are nostalgic about whiskey, some people will argue are better than the more modern contemporary releases. That is what Diageo is competing with right now. They are not McAllen. That's Talisker. It's a completely different thing. I was predicting that if we ever reached a point where the primary market started to compete with the secondary, things would get really interesting. I think that that's already shown signs of happening. Now, it might mean that the secondary dries up a little bit, and if people see that they're going to lose money on whiskies, they're going to hold off, and they're not going to put it through auction. There's lots of complexities and dynamics here, but a lot of those Talisker 18s, they were bought years ago, and they've just been sitting on the shelf. They were paid 60 or 70 or 80 pounds for it, and if they get 100 pounds back for it, they've made a bit of money, or they've liquidated something that was just sitting there as an ornament. It's not going to suddenly dry up. I guarantee you there are no brand new contemporary Talister that I could see going through at auction. Nobody's paying £175 and trying to sell it for more. It's nuts what's happening. How about the Scapa 12? Wonderful stuff eh, from about the same time as that 15-year-old Longmorn was available. That one I liked a lot too, and it was 40% as well. That kind of beige, that kind of uh, pale brown coloured label, right? Absolutely, Mika. It was... It was one of the first whiskies I was ever gifted by my friend uh, Keith. He did a, he loves whiskey now, he's got his own collection. He kicks himself for giving me that scapa. But he was gifted it for something, a favour he did, and he immediately just passed it on to me. <laughs> I loved it, absolutely adored that bottle. Justin Rand is saying someone's losing money, but sorry, I picked that one up, Justin, and Jimmy is saying they're only losing money if they didn't steal it. Hi. And Tom is saying, uh, was there some interaction between you and Daniel Whittington with the Longmorn 16? You gave him a bottle or he gave you a dram? Yes. So Daniel couldn't get his hands on his, he, he loves that Longmorn 16 too. And I took him a bottle over one year 
And occasionally what will happen is that if, if we're together, he'll grab the long one 16 and we'll potentially share a wee dram or something. I just checked the Talisker, 8, 2021. 20, Aquavite could have grabbed it for £50. We need to keep our eyes open, Whiskey Vault, don't we? Justin is saying, in other words, past Diageo is competing with present day Diageo. Exactly that. Exactly that. Malt Brother Ray saying the retail prices went up due to high auction prices. Uh, what is the chance that the retail prices will drop now? <laughs> Reducing the price going backwards is a very hard thing to do. It's not an easy look to pull off. I don't know what they're going to do, but every retailer I've spoken to, some retailers are not even stocking Talisker 18 because it's a red face for them. We're talking about UK retailers here. And the ones that have it on the shelf are just admitting to me that they are not moving. They're embarrassed to, to put it in the hands of somebody who used to come in and buy it for 80 or 90 pounds and tell them it's 175. That's, that's the, the shoot the messenger is re very real there, right? It's not, there's nobody from Diageo there to take the flack for that. But Diageo are shifting their focus to other markets and they want to position a product and they want it to be seen as premium. They don't want people looking at it and saying, well, why is that 300 and that's 100? The 300 must be better because that's the way that people view these things. People that are uninformed, people that are, you know, easy to get money. For, I, don't, I want to be polite. Diageo are trying to position. That's what they're doing and they're a business. A business run by short-termism, by performance for shareholders, the, the immediate, the now. We are in a time now <laughs> that Diageo are just moving and taking their stuff out of the landscape and there is a, there are hordes of other producers coming in. I'm heading to Rassi next week to hang out with one of them. Somebody who's watching all of these new distilleries eh, grow up alongside them, seeing this zeitgeist, seeing this vibrant, vibrant scene. And they're wondering, they're saying, well, where are we going to get the retail space? And they're saying, they're seeing that it's going to happen because people like Diageo, but potentially other producers doing the same thing, trying to premiumize and taking their, their stock off the retail shelves to make space for all these new distilleries coming in. And guess what? The new distilleries are bringing out us, bringing us natural product, this unchill filtered, and they're not adding color. And they're telling us that they're not adding color, and they're telling us that they're keeping it natural. And they're making whiskey in a way where they're putting flavor first rather than efficiency first. Some of it will be successful and amazing, some of it less so. But none of it will be made for pure volume's sake. None of it is getting made to be a blend component. It is fabulous. And if we still want to keep our nostalgic glasses on, we can still do that thing. I'm not going to open this one, but I'll show you this. Back when I first got into whiskey, I loved my Glenfiddich 12 because it was always there. It was dependable. It was like a wee friend. And I always had a Glenfiddich 12 on hand. It was very inexpensive back in the day. I remember paying less than £20 occasionally for a bottle of Glenfiddich 12. Um, similar livery to this one. This is not Glenfiddich 12. This is Glenfiddich 18. Now, if you were to go out and buy a Glenfiddich 18 in a completely modern livery, the contemporary version today, you would be uh, expected to pay 80 or 90 pounds for it. It's 18 year old malt whiskey, 40% ABV, I believe, maybe 43 where you are. Fine, that's just, that's just the way of it today. You can go on to an auction and buy, and I'm, by the way, I'm going back to, I think this is about a 2006 bottling. So the malt in this goes back to the late 80s, early 90s. You could pick up this bottle for about 70 or 75 pounds. Now suddenly you realize that, uh, how can it, how can these, the, the companies see the demand. How long are we going to continue to kind of pay these prices when we can go back and sip things from history, sip things that once stirred our nostalgia or potentially we've heard how it stirred other people's uh, epiphanies and whiskey journeys? I've had that for a long time, that Glenfiddich. That will be opened one day. I've opened a miniature of it. 
and I've opened, I've tried it against the contemporary Glenfiddich 18, and I, you would struggle to suggest that they're even from the same distillery. The older, this is actually the, the original 18-year-old that was called the Ancient Reserve. It's one to look out for. It's in this livery. The difference in flavor is stunning. Stunning. Potentially, they'd have been overaging back in 2006. I'm not sure. Let's flip back to that those videos I was telling you about earlier, the top five. A lot of you might remember me putting this at number one. This is Glenn Goyne's 25-year-old. Now, this is not that bottle. This is a, a little bit more recent bottle. I don't know when I bought this. Maybe I bought this in 2018 or something, but it wasn't the original bottle. Um, I've had an okay time with this. There's some people in the chat tonight. Ben, Whiskey with Molly. A few others were here the night that I opened this bottle. Um, and it's been good. I've clearly been enjoying it. It's nice to give people a treat of a Glen Goyne 25-year-old, but it's not, it's not what I remember. Is that the organic part there, or is it the whiskey changing? It matters not. If you wanted to buy a Glen Goyne, I paid £220 for that because you used to get a discount when you toured Glen Goyne. You could get it a bit cheaper, and they give you a discount off at £220. That cost me. It's probably double that now. I'm not sure. I haven't even checked recently how much Glen Goyne 25-year-old would cost these days. So it's off the radar. But Glen Goyne 25-year-old now, think about it, it'd be late 1990s. One of the most celebrated Glen Goyne releases was a 17-year-old. Here's a Glen Goyne 17, long since discontinued. Now it's, it's typically presented the way that Glen Goyne present their product of 43%, but it is natural colour, and it actually says it on the label here in big letters just down the bottom of that beige label. You can see it. 17-year-old. So it's not the 25-year-old, it's maybe a bit closer to the modern 18-year-old, which is about £125 a bottle retail online just now. Some places have got a wee bit cheaper than that, but that's the retail for Glen Goyne 18 at the moment. This 17-year-old product, so the, the livery that I have tonight, is seems to be around about somewhere in the order of 2010, let's say, maybe a wee bit older than that, puts it right in the middle to early 1990s. So we can taste 1990s Glen Goyne for somewhere in the order of 80 quid on auction. This is not Springbank. This is not McAllen. People aren't going nuts for this. But I guarantee you, this wee Glen Goyne was celebrated. And when it was made, when it was discontinued, I remember back in the day when I was getting into Glen Goyne and I missed out on the 17-year-old. And I was told, oh, the 17-year-old is discontinued now, but that was a cracking drum. That was a cracking drum. Well, I'm about to try it just now. I just need to be careful with these old corks, of course. Well, let's, we're going to get a nice glug here. So now, this has been in glass for something like potentially it could be as much as 15 years, right? It's been in a bottle a long time. Heavy sherry cask, beautiful heavy sherry cask. There's a fustiness here, there's an age here, there's a depth here, there's dunnage in the nose here. This is just, just a neck pour, just out of the bottle. First time that this has breathed since potentially, like I say, about 15 years. Incredible, incredible nose. 43% is actually helping me to nose this, stick my nose right in the glass. But there's a sense of balance. There's a sense of decadence here. Stewed, cooked, boozy fruit, raisins, prune. A soft, suede, leather type thing. A wee bit of tobacco even. Not much in the way of spice, it's, everything is quite soft. Cheers, everyone. It's balance, just balance. Yes, it's very sherry forward, but there's no big tannic hit here. Everything is just soft and check. Elegant, decadent, clean. 
there is a sense of age here. Mellow, rounded, long finish. My goodness, what a finish. He's got just just goes to a kind of a milk chocolatey thing, almost like a sense that you've when you just the finish that milk chocolate has, the way it, milk chocolate leaves your palate. Now I've had this a long time. But as I say, if you were to check recent auctions, this is going as low here and there, 70 and 80 pounds. Glengoyne potentially then are competing with the, their primary market is competing with the secondary. Now there's simply not enough of it out there in the secondary market to hold that up. Potentially the prices could bump because there's enough people in the VPUB tonight that they all go, oh, I quite like the sound of that Glengoyne. I'm going to go out and look for that. So don't all rush for the auction at the same time. Relax. There is 101 other whiskies out there in the exact same condition and situation because as the retail prices are doing this suddenly they are competing more and more with the stuff in the past and they're outstripping the stuff from the past Whiskey Vault is saying have you seen your own bottle at an auction site already you mean an Aquavite uh, uh, one of the, the Barflies Loch Lone release no I haven't has that happened? I would buy it myself. Nobody sell that at auction. Talk to me. I would buy it back from you. Well, brother, Ray saying the retail prices went up due to high auction prices. Okay, that, sorry, I did. I picked that one up, didn't I, Ray? Sorry, buddy. Rick Johnson is saying, hey, Roy, just to keep you honest, you're at the one hour mark. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Ryan Sutherland is saying, uh, one hour warning. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> My brother, Ray saying, the sherry cast in the 1990s were amazing. Maybe it's the uh, Paxarette that was playing a role. Well, Paxarette, mm, potentially but that was a 1980s that was outlawed that was the the practice was stopped but yes absolutely if you're picking up something that was potentially matured in those casks that were treated with paxarette but i'm not sure i'm not sure about that with this one glengoyne even when it was owned by edrington back in the day way before ian mcleod took over the distillery they would have been using pretty good quality sherry casks i'm confident of that would they have used paxarette potentially Lovely, dusty Dunnage note fills the glass. Oh my goodness, this is good whiskey. It's wonderful. I've had this for a long time, but it's wonderful to have it open now. So if I'm going to get nostalgic about Glengoyne, and if I'm going to get frustrated about the prices I have to pay today, I've got places to go. Not least I've got folk out there in the community that are all sharing their whiskey too. But if I really want that bottle, if I really want to step and understand what people are talking about when they talk about the old days and the nostalgia and we can connect with it make a wee list of the bottles that you want and look at them don't rush be patient the whiskey will come to you don't spend more than you have to know that there's always another auction there are lots and lots of auction houses out there i tend to use swa Whiskey Auctioneer up in Perth, SWA's in Glasgow, Whiskey Auctioneer in Perth. I've used one or two others, but not often. But there's, there's, there are lots of whiskey uh, auctions out there. If you're patient, you will be able to get these things and you will not need to pay the crazy prices that's been asked at retail today. You will be able to try and substantiate some of that nostalgia, whether it's your own nostalgia or something that you're hearing from somebody else. Jimmy Legacy, and I think I'll pour an Aquaviti Loch Lomond right now Thank you, Peter Lee. Good for you, Jimmy. Let me know how you got on with that. I know you seem to be enjoying it. So I'm going to put this, I better put these in order, put the Anok first, put the Longmorn, and then put our Glen going there before I get into one of my biggest nostalgia. The thing that, if you were to ask me to pick one distillery, everything else on a level playing field and just go by flavor and just go by experience and pick one distillery it would be tough for me to do it would really be tough but there's a good chance that if the if the day was right it was on the right day Kleinleash would be that thing and that's the distillery i'm going to talk about next surely all of klein leash has gone out of reach now right all the good klein leash we can't get anymore it's stupidly priced stupidly priced i'm part of the problem i've been raving about klein leash especially 1990s Kleinleash for years. 
so I can't complain about the prices when I talk when I tell you guys all the time how amazing it was for me and my nostalgic whiskey journey. Good to see Hell's Within. Thanks for looking after me tonight, Helen, uh, one of our moderators, uh, alongside Sugar Kitty. And Sugar Kitty said that you got some of these acry acrylic coins I caught. So I still don't know your identity, Sugar Kitty. I still don't. I've obviously shipped something to you, but I didn't connect the Sugar Kitty part. Uh, good to have you in. And Alistair Gray's looking after us as well, as well as Rolfie F. Ebhead. Um, great stuff. Cleanly's for me, and I'll show you the bottle that did it. And it's sealed. It's going to go alongside my Lagavulin 12 here because I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it. I'm not. I can't afford this anymore. So when this gets opened, it's going to be quite a momentous, a momentous thing. But this is the the one I held up to you in one of those original videos way back in the day. Um, I went through a hell of a lot of bottles of this, as did my buddy, the Whiskey Rev. And this is a 1995 uh, a signature vintage cast strength, a 20-year-old Klein Leash. 1990s Klein Leash redefined a depth of flavor for me. This is from a refill sherry cask. Typically it's ex-bourbon I'm looking for, for when it comes to Klein Leash. But this, again, this taught me that no, refill sherry works very, very well with this distillate too. And I just felt this whiskey was like nothing I'd ever enjoyed before. I thought it was incredible and I paid 89 pounds for it. I think if I was to pick this up now, I'd be north of 300 for this now, not sure. But it's of that order. So you can hear me raving about, wow, 1990s Klein Leash, and then feel disconnected because you look at the prices and you say, what? when am I? How can I? That's not going to happen for me. I'm lucky that I can get Klein Leash 14 today, and that's about it. Well, you can find, you might remember the Game of, Game of Thrones releases, that's actually still in retail, and it's a pretty good dram. But of course, the 14-year-old, and that Game of Thrones release, which I believe, gone from memory, was a nine-year-old. That's not 1990s Klein Leash, is it? So it's going to be different distally. It's going to be younger Klein Leash. And even if it's the same age, potentially it's not going to be something, it's certainly not, it's not going to be something that's uh, distilled in 1990. I've got something here to show you. Highland Hamish is saying, uh, older Klein Leash climbing away from us, but Thompson Brothers bringing some great newer stock to market at reasonable prices. I agree. Through the Indies, you can pick it up. It tends to be called a secret Highland, but be wary of that. Uh, Thompson Brothers are not doing this. If they put a cat on the bottle, there's a good chance that it's Klein Leash, but it's only a matter of time before less scrupulous uh, producers out there just decide that something that's remotely, uh, or whether it's Klein Leash in profile or not, they're going to put something in the bottle call it a, 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 a secret highland, put a wee cat up in the corner and we all start to talk, talk and the chatter becomes, oh, it's Klein Leash, it's Klein Leash. When it's not, it's maybe still good whiskey, maybe it's a nice Glen Ord or something like that, but it's not Klein Leash in the end. I, it's, it's a worry for that hidden distillery thing. However, I agree with you, Hamish. Good to see you, buddy. I think Mark is going to be hooking up with you when he's up in Inverness. That would be amazing. Whiskey Games has seen sorry, late to the V-Pub. There's no such thing, Matthew, but it's good to have you in. One of my nostalgic drams is the Glenferric 15 Distillers Edition, the 51% ABV. Why don't I buy Glenferric now? I don't know. Well, one of the ones that I held up to you there was the Glenferric Ancient Reserve 18-year-old. It's not at 51% ABV. It's still low ABV, Matthew, yes. But you're picking it up much, much cheaper, despite it being 1990s distillate, right? Much, much cheaper than the contemporary Gladferic 18s. Ian, uh, whiskey and that. Good to see you, Ian. I hope you're keeping well, buddy. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're enjoying the gig. He sent uh, Evening Aquavita. I've been trying to get some 90s Johnny Walker bottles at auction, but keep getting sniped at the last minute. Having listened to Dramface Pod, I think I know why. Just be patient. These The Johnny Walkers that I've got you, they're obscured tonight, but they're always sitting over my shoulder here. I got them very, very inexpensively just by being patient. When there's not a clamor, when there's a few extra on auction, when somebody's not looking for it, it only takes one other pe person to compete with you at auction for you to get sniped or for you end up maybe having to consider paying too much. Just be patient, please. It's 1970 Brora uh, Aquavitae, or <laughs> no, it isn't, buddy, it is not. And Falscraft is saying, okay, Klein Leash is one of the bottles that I might come near to being nostalgic about. It was my first cast strength whiskey and a real experience. So Klaus, you know what I'm talking about. We, we get the Klein Leash thing. But it's very inconsistent. Sometimes Klein Leash can be a bit rough. 
honestly speaking, because of a process, because of bad cask, because of a myriad of reasons that all whiskey suffers from, not just because it says clean leash in the bottle doesn't mean it's great. Graham Brown is in saying, even in Aquavita and Barflies, Graham, congratulations to you, buddy, on your, your great news. And Al Young is saying, if I want something mentioned on the show, I need to go to auction, which I do. Uh, unfortunately, not a great selection in Canada. I watch closely to get a good deal for some hard-to-get drams. And uh, patience is the secret, Al. Absolutely, baby. absolutely. Listen, when I see the name Al there, uh, I just want to raise a wee glass, and I'll raise a wee glass of this uh, delicious Glengoyne. Uh, one of our friends in the community is a wee bit poorly right now, and needing a wee bit extra uh, strength and good wishes and support. And that's um, Al from Whiskey Straight Al. If anybody of you know from Al from Northern Ireland, he's one of the Hallian Battalion, uh, one of our crew, one of us. Uh, and he's going through a wee bit of a hard time with health right now. He's doing okay, and he's strong. He's a good, strong man, and he'll do well out of it. He'll do a wee bit better with good wishes and strength from us. Literally raise your glasses to Al, and remember that that word slantia literally means good health. Al, wishing you all the best, buddy. Cheers to you. Let's go with Molly and his saying, my nostalgic... First stumble into Shah. Going, going is so good. It's so good. So tasty. My nostalgic first stumble into Sherry Cask was with Glenn Farkless, but I haven't bought any in years. Finding the whole thing a bit dull and expensive now. Maybe maybe you're not talking about Glenn Farkless necessarily, or maybe you are. Maybe you're maybe talking about uh, a Sherry Cask in general. It's wonderful to see the outpouring of uh, raised Glen Cairns and everyone for Al. Terrific stuff. Uh, aye. I'm sure he'll pull through, but he's got a better chance of pulling through with support from all his pals. Right, so Klein Leash it is for me. I showed you the 1990s bottle here. I've got 1990s Klein Leash in a bottle here. 1990s. Some of you will know the bottle I've got in my hand here. I've had it for a long, long time. Uh, I tried to look back on my option uh, history and all of the stuff for that, but I eventually discovered where I got this from. I actually bought this from our whiskey pal Bob Scully, and he's occasionally in. Um, but this is a, a Klein Leash. Uh, I've had a couple of these over the years. This was by far the oldest one, and one that I kept for an occasion. This is Klein Leash uh, Distiller's Edition, which is essentially Klein Leash 14, I'm led to believe. But they put it in for a, a further maturation and an additional cask for the Dist Distiller's Edition series. And for this, they talk uh, they talk about double matured and Oloroso, uh, they actually say Oloroso Seco a uh, cask wood. But it's Oloroso Seco, it's just Oloroso. So we, if you were buying this today, uh, I think even today, I think they've dropped the vintage statements on it. They don't put an age statement on it anymore. I don't know what's happening here. But if you would pay a wee bit more than you would for Klein Leash 14, all the distillers editions are a wee bit more than the core expression that they're based on from Diageo. But I'm not buying anything from Diageo right now. Literally nothing. Yes, I'll buy Diageo dist distillate eh, through independent bottlers and other things like that. And I'll certainly enjoy drinking the Diageo stuff I've got on hand. But they're getting no more of my money now. They're just playing. I, until they change the game that they're playing, that's the way I'm going to I'm going to put them on their naughty step, at least for a little while. But I've had this for a long time now. And if I was to go out and pick up, I didn't buy this at auction. I've had it for a long time. If I was to go and pick it out today, there was a bottle that went this year at auction of this Klein Leash here for way less than £100. £80. It might be the one I've still got open. Let's have a wee look. No. Less than £100. What we have to remember here is that this has been in bottle for a long time. It tells us on the, if I, if I bring this up, let's get the camera up and I'll try and get it to focus so that you can see this. It tells you down here, bottled in 2006, distilled 1991. It's got a vintage statement on it. It tells us that this is early 90s Klein Leash. Fantastic. Let's get it opened. Like I said, when I was talking about the refill sherry from Signature, I tend to prefer my Klein Leash, mostly bourbon cast matured. 
but I'm okay to open my mind a wee bit. Reb's in tonight saying, so true about the second-hand market. I recently bought an out-of-fashion Glenmorne J18 and the old pre-Louis Vuitton Moe Hennessy cardboard tubes. Very reasonable and a lovely example of old bourbon barrels. Brilliant stuff, Rep. Oh, no, I think we might have a... This cork might not survive this. Let's try. Yeah. I could feel it. I could feel it. Just an old-timer cork. What can I do? Maybe push this one in and then fish it out later. We've got some some brittle pieces. I should have had my tea strainer on hand. Now, I should know better. Remember when we opened the Lafroy when John Campbell was on? I got away with it that night. Let's see if I get away with it tonight. I don't want too much of that cork spilling into my glass here. We're okay, we've managed it. But you see, I'm going to have to do a bit of a rescue mission there. Drop a shoelace in, and you can hook the shoelace around the cork, and you can bring the cork out, uh, and then you can pour all of the whiskey into a jug, put it through a coffee filter if you've got lots of these little tiny specks of cork in it, uh, put it through a tea strainer, whatever you do, and then uh, re-decant it uh, or refill uh, the bottle again. But I've got some work to do. And that's what happens with these old timers. I mean, this is 2006, this was bottled, as I said, so this cork has kind of uh, started to decay uh, really quite quickly. What's that, 17 years or so? Anyway, let's get a wee nose. Oh, yeah. Yep, yep, yep. There's a wee funky edge to this. And it's not old bottle effect. There's a wee kind of, um, I'm looking for old bottle effect and it's here. There's a wee bit of it here, not too much. But there's a kind of funky edge here, like a wee bit. <laughs> no, it's not muck. It's not muck. It's more like wet, outdoor, mulch, grassy type note. But it's definitely farmyard and, 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 you know, the sense, the feeling is a kind of farm farmyard environment. Completely different sherry from, from that uh, Glengoyne. Here, we're, we're, everything's drier, everything's a bit sharper, everything's a bit firmer. And the waxiness is there. The waxiness is there. All you have to do is think about just scratching your fingernail down a, a thick white uh, wax candle or even a box of uh, Crayola crayons. Oh, terrific. Roman uh, Scrovenek, Scrovenek? Roman, I hope I'm pronouncing your name well, buddy. He's bought us a dram to say, uh, got to cut it short today, hope to run into some of you in Limburg next week, looking out for some freckled guy with funny nose wearing a Wolfburn shirt. Roman, I'll look out for you in Limburg, that's amazing. Uh, nice to have you in, Roman, and thanks for your dram. Let's see how this wee clean leash goes down. This is a type of whiskey that you would be able to pick up at Limburg. I'm going to say this because I'm on the VPUB and I've been looking forward to this is nostalgia for me. This is everything is here. It's hitting me. This is resplendent. 46% ABV, I believe, but it's perfect. It's so thick. It's so oily. It's so clean leash. This is the Oloroso casks here are not dominant. It's there a wee bit. This is not a sherry bomb. Mm. There's very few examples of this type of product from this distillery that you can pick up for this money that gives you this experience. This is one of them. Absolutely terrific whiskey. Genuinely terrific whiskey. I love all the Diageo distilleries. I love visiting them. I love feeling the place. I love touching the place. I love going around them. I hate the way that the Diageo product is sold to us in these days. I am grateful that we have a buoyant community and a buoyant secondary market so that we 
still have the privilege of being able to connect with these whiskies and understand why they became nostalgic or otherwise legends. I've given you the examples tonight. Whether it's the Glengoin, whether it's the Klein Leash, Anok, Longmorn, whether it's any of these Lagavulins, most of the examples I've given you tonight, bizarrely, with the exception of Anok and Longmorn, but all of the ones I've been speaking about, the Diageo, the Klein Leash, the Lagavulin, the Talisker, the Glengoins, all of these, you can get similar or pot potentially arguably better experiences with, certainly in the case of Lagavulin, certainly in the case of Talisker, by not purchasing from retail, not paying through the nose for a lesser product, and being patient and looking at the secondary market, looking out for old dusties, looking out for friends who have got bottles and that are willing to share or do bottle splits with you within the community. The whiskey will find you. So much of our whiskey journeys are based on nostalgia. Absolutely. Whiskey is changing. It's changing all the time. Some producers out there are behaving in a way like they are sitting on the crown jewels that it's, it's, it's an extremely limited quantity, which it is not, not the way they're making out, and that they are the only one that's going to have anything worthy. That's not happening. There's new whiskey coming all the time. And we've spent VPUB after VPUB after VPUB celebrating it. And I hope you join me next week from Rassi where we'll be able to do that very thing. We also have the ability through the community and through the things that are set up, that sea of whiskey, that glass lock that's out there, all of these bottles that are still out there sealed, maybe with decaying corks occasionally. That's not all going to be opened. It's going to make its way onto the secondary market. The secondary market will continue to be buoyant. The auction houses will continue to make their money because they don't care whether they make their money on things that have tripled in value or things that are more or less the same or things that have dropped in value. There's always going to be an audience for touching these older products, these discontinued products. It's always going to exist. And if we're enthusiasts, if we're drinkers, if we're lovers of the journey of whiskey, whether we're nostalgic or misty-eyed or not, if we are mere spectators, we don't care what the secondary market is doing and we don't care what the primary market is doing because we'll work as a community to find where the barg bargains and value are. And if it goes in the opposite direction and everything starts to slow down, if everything softens, we still remain a community of drinkers, people that are here for the flavour and making experiences with each other today that inevitably are going to build the nostalgia of tomorrow. Please don't everybody run out to auction and say, oh, I find this amazing, these amazing bargains and things. They're not, they're slim pickings. But find your lane, find your whiskies, find your things, the things that will inspire or fire your nostalgia of the past or today or tomorrow, and be patient. Look at more than one auction house, look at more than one retailer, study the dusties, study uh, just, be patient, whiskey will find you and it will come to you. And I hope when it does, it can be as amazing. <laughs> That's incredible. That's not going to last long. This whiskey is not going to last long. It's so much to explore. So much to explore. Terrific stuff. How am I doing on time now? Who's watching the time? I'm at 1 hour 23. Let's see what I've missed. I have to remind everybody that there is a lock in this. All the patrons, every month I try to do a Sunday night lock in for patrons. Sometimes it's really tough, eh, but I'm doing one on Sunday this week as well. Uh, Jimmy Leg, I sent you an email. Uh, I did get an SMTP bounce from it. I tried to send it again. I hope you got it. Um, but maybe you and I can have a chat about Sunday night's lock in. Um, but there's a, a lock-in uh, this uh, Sunday night from 9 o'clock. Uh, that's just me hanging out with patrons. It's a much more laid-back thing. There's no theme to it. Um, we just relax and have a wee bit of Sunday night whiskey time together. But I want to also um, uh, give a shout-out to uh, 
the Whiskey Diary, I mentioned him at the start of this. The guy's doing fantastic, good quality content. Um, he's doing okay for subs and he's growing all the time and he deserves to be growing. Uh, but he did a video that I caught earlier today that is very on point. Uh, a slightly different angle on things. But he managed to pick up a Glenallachie, he managed to pick up a Bimber, and he managed to pick up a Kilcarran. All, and he put up the prices that he paid, he added up the retail prices, and then he added up what he paid at auction for all of these contemporary whiskies, and what he paid was less. Uh, I'm going to grab the link because I think I have it, and I'll just, I'm going to drop this in here to say, I hope that you know, Ben, I hope you know the Whiskey Diary, but it's a fantastic thing to watch. It backs up exactly my point of the VPUB tonight. Excuse me. Uh, I don't mind that Klein Leash repeating on me like that because it tastes good in both directions. <laughs> Apologies, I'm oversharing a wee bit. Um, but I also want to uh, put a huge shout out to Cousin Kevin. Now, my cousin is my cousin, and he has never once came to me asked for a plug, asked for a favour, asked for a collaboration, asked for anything. And he finally, off his own back, reached a thousand subscribers this last week. What a star. What a trooper. For anybody that doesn't know, I've put his link in the, the chat there as well, and I'll leave the links for all of these channels underneath. For anybody that doesn't know, when you reach a thousand subscribers on YouTube, things start to switch on. You can monetize. You can start to monetize your content the time that you're put. Port. It takes a long time to get there, especially in a niche realm like whiskey. But the channels that grind it out, that grind it out, they eventually get there and the, the more tools are open to them. So reaching that 1,000 subscribers is really, really important. Congratulations, Cousin Kevin. Cheers, buddy. I've put his link in there and I'm going to put up one more channel. Because here's somebody that I think brings out absolutely unique content. Humorous, tongue-in-cheek, doing it like nobody else is doing it, focusing on good value whiskies as well. And that is Jeff Whiskey. And he's currently 942 subscribers. And I think that he's been grinding out for so long that I, he deserves to get to that thousand. Now I don't think that we can get him to a thousand subs tonight. He's at 942 right now. But we can get him closer to there. We can help him along. I think he deserves to get to that critical mass as well in order that he can start to step up things in Whiskey Tube as well. Love to be able to support everyone that grinds it out, the people that put the and also the people that are humble and modest and kind and collaborative and thoughtful and all of the things that we love about our whiskey community, community in general. I don't care that I'm competing for watched minutes. It doesn't matter because you're going to find these channels eventually anyway, and you're going to love them and start to watch them. And if that means that you watch less uh, Aquavite time, then so be it. That's going to happen anyway. The more that we can celebrate the good quality content in YouTube, celebrating whiskey with integrity and honesty, with interesting takes and different angles on things, the better a space it is for everybody. And the three channels that I've just mentioned, Ben at the Whiskey Diary, Kevin Grant on Whiskey, and Jeff's Whiskey, all foster community through their own channels as well. Andy is saying, Jeff is excellent. And Graham Young is saying, Jeff got another one just now. He's at 947, says Gino, fantastic. Young goes saying, described, and they slap it with, he's famous, he's, he's done this. I don't know if he's gonna, I don't know if he's hinting, seems to be he's hinting in some of his recent videos that he's gonna retire the, bottle slap thing or not. I'm waiting to see what's going to happen there. And just, but he gets people on. Uh, I've I've been on slapping bottles for Jeff. Ralphie's been on slapping bottles for Jeff. And a horde of other folk are quite happy to get their bottle slap on for a wee bit of tongue-in-cheek whiskey fun to support our Jeff. Brilliant stuff. I think if we get the wheels on the quiz, we might nip under the two-hour mark tonight. What do you think? Thinking about the last time that we made it under two hours would be a nostalgic thought indeed. Somebody mentioned to me recently that, Roy, you, your face is quite red, you're quite flushed. And just generally, I've, I'm from the west of Scotland. That's kind of my complexion. 
Um, if I drink uh, uh, whiskey, that's probably going to be exaggerated a wee bit. It's always been the case. It's just the way it is. Um, I've been checked out for it and all of that stuff. Everything's is fine. But I noticed that I'm a wee bit pink tonight. And I noticed the company that I was keeping last night, which was fabulous as well, that probably I was I was the, the reddest out of them all, but they were all from uh, uh, much sunnier, warmer climes, I think, in the US. If you are staying for the quiz at the end, please, I would welcome you to. Um, I'm going to enjoy just sipping these whiskies as we get through. I might pour a wee bit more of this Klein Lisa actually and enjoy it. It's fantastic. And I'm going to compare these Lagavulins. But remember my takeaway tonight. If Honestly, I'm going to tell you about these Lagavulins. I still love my 2017. I love the fizz, the brightness, the effervescent. Tonight it was playing a wee bit like a sugared lime, almost like a lime cheesecake or something. Fantastic. The 2021 I've got here uh, from Shane and the 2022, the one I bought, both of them are, I can imagine a lot of people saying even, maybe even better than the 2017. There's more cask influence here. They're slightly darker in colour too. They're a richer experience, a wee bit less fizz, a wee bit more rounded, a wee bit more, maybe you could even suggest that there's a wee bit more body to them. I can see why people prefer them. The only reason I think I would pick the 2017 over these is nostalgia. But remember what I've pointed out to you tonight. If you're in the market for a Lagavulin 12-year-old cast strength, whether if it's from 2010, 2015, 2020, it doesn't matter, check options first. Hardly any of them, some of the older stuff, of course, the rarer stuff, yes, but so, so many of them are cheaper than the £135 that Diageo are asking at retail just now. I apologise to all my retailer friends out there if I'm if I'm making it difficult for you, if I'm if it's not what you what I should be doing. But I always I'm looking at it from the side of the consumer, and I think that your job is made harder as retailers by uh, producers who are overpricing and looking at the very short term uh, side of things. Whiskey with Molly, spot on. He's saying. It's just a Glasgow tan. And Falscraft is actually did get to Spain for a couple of days at the weekend there. So I did manage to pick up a wee bit of pinking tint from the sun in Spain. Falscraft is saying the official VPUB was great. Looking forward to the nostalgic quiz. <laughs> and North Coast Drama, I, good to see you, Tony. saying think of it as a healthy glow. Brilliant and prestige liquids. Andrew's in saying Jeff at 1973. Prestige liquids, WW. He's another YouTuber in here. It's amazing how many YouTube channels are actually active in here too. So Jeff, uh, apparently he's at, he's 942 here. Let's do a wee refresh. Uh, he's at 973, brilliant stuff. So we've helped him a huge, huge chunk on to unlocking all the tricks of YouTube that he'll reach uh, that magical uh, 1000. I hope he gets there. Let's drop his link in one more time and uh, everybody give Jeff Whiskey a wee sub. He's a fabulous guy as well. Kind, patient, humble modest, all the things that we like about our whiskey folk. It's not a requirement, but anyway, Spencer Max is saying, eh, Aquavite Test X. Eh, Spencer Max, that looks like a new name. Welcome in here. Eh, I hope you're doing well. And Peter Lee is saying, I'm home. I had Gary Hitch in my restaurant tonight and loving his meal. Just home now and sitting with Denise. Fantastic. I know that Gary's eh, in, in Scotland because he had some merch shipped to his hotel. <laughs> we had to time it perfectly, but I think it worked out okay. Terrific stuff. Can you give Gav's Dram a shout out? Absolutely, my friend Gav is a tremendous guy. Let's see how Gav's doing. Since we're giving the Gav the, the shout outs tonight, let's Gav deserves it as well. Gav's Drams. Now, if you want somebody who's brutally honest, buys all his own whiskey, opens all his own whiskey, his most recent review here, or one of his most recent reviews is, he's opened a Springbank local barley. He's hit the magic 500, but he's only halfway there to his uh, thousand. So let's give my pal over on the East Coast, Gav, a wee shout out and pick up some of his. Uh, that's that's me for the for the shout outs tonight. I appreciate what I'm asking. I'm not asking you all to kind of go off and invest time. Just try out a couple of the videos and remember that you don't always take to something. Think about your experiences with the VPUB the first couple of times you watch it understand what the angle is, understand what the unique take is that they're bringing. Um, every single creator out there is doing it their own way, the way that they know how, and they're all bringing 
unique stuff. Whiskey Wings is saying, I'm sipping electric 10, chilling out before a wedding tomorrow. I need a new hip flask suggestion for the wedding. Hip flask for me, the, the softer spirits can sometimes, I sometimes get a bit of a taint from, from hip flask. I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm leaving it in there too long. Maybe it's because sometimes I'm impatient and sipping it straight from the hip flask, hip flask which makes sense. Um, but why don't you put something spring-like? Why don't you put something fruity in there? Uh, that's Whiskey Wings. Is that Mike? I feel like it's Mike. Uh, I think you're half of the um, Honest to a Malt podcast, aren't you, Whiskey Wings? Is that you? Am I getting you confused? Uh, I'm up to date with the Whis uh, Honest to a Malt podcast. I'm listening to much more whiskey podcasts now because I'm going for long walks at lunchtime. Uh, I even listened back to, or listened back to the most recent Dramface podcast and had a lot of fun uh, listening to uh, to that as well as so many other whiskey podcasts too. So much whiskey content out there. Anyway, let's get this quiz underway. Uh, uh, remember, it's always multiple choice. There is not a theme to tonight's quiz, Jimmy Leg. Uh, there's no theme tonight, it's just random questions. I have tried to pitch it so that some people have got a chance of getting that magical 10 out of 10, but there will be, especially towards the end, banana skins and the inevitable ass hat. The first half of the quiz should be fairly easy, so most of you have got a good chance of hitting the magical 5 out of 10 pass mark. Remember that it's always multiple choice. You don't need to shout your score out. You can keep it to yourself. You can just play along. It's all for fun. And even if you don't know the answers, even if it's tricky, hopefully the majority of the questions can help uh, inform and teach a wee bit too. Good luck, everyone. Rob Smith is claiming one out of 10 already. Good for you, buddy. Take it and run. <laughs> Great stuff. Mika is saying the Lager 2017 distillery exclusive is not very good compared to 2016 jazz. That is very good seaweed and all. Yeah, always good if you can try these types of things first. One of the greatest things about visiting the distillery is most of the time they let you do. Sugar Kitty is saying banana skin ass hat. That's the Aquavite quiz. I have spoken to Menno tonight and we're trying to tee up a, a, a quiz, a Menno quiz in the future. I just hope it's not as brutal as the one <laughs> that cousin Kevin and I sat and uh, competed against each other where he demolished me. Uh, it was a brutal quiz. Great stuff. Good luck, everybody. Ten questions starting now. Come on. How easy can it be? Who writes the Malt Whiskey Yearbook? Who writes it? The Malt Whiskey Yearbook is the majority of quiz questions that's ever been brought to you on the VPUB quiz at the end. So much of it has been mined within the wealth of knowledge that is the annual publication that is the Malt Whiskey Yearbook. Who writes it? Is it Gavin D. Smith? Is it Charlie McLean? Or is it Ingvar Ronde? Is it A. Gavin Smith? Gavin D. Smith? B. Charlie McLean? Or C. Ingvar Ronde? Nice and easy to start things off. If you don't have the Malt Whiskey Yearbook, I cut it. I don't know if it's is it still available. I'm saying this. I, I hope it's still available. Occasionally, some years do sell out. Um, this You need to have this book. If you love Scotch whiskey, if you love malt whiskey, actually, because it covers global malt whiskey production, if you love malt whiskey, you have to have this book. It's just, it's a gem. It's like a friend. Whiskey with Molly saying J.R. Hartley. <laughs> <laughs> a reference to the old Yellow Pages ad there from the 1980s. Well done, Ben. Absolutely, you've kicked that out of the park. It's obviously our friend uh, and occasional barfly, Ingvar Rondi, and a uh, great gentleman he is as well, and a hard-working guy, too, to put that book together every year. Question two in 1872. Which of these distilleries was rebuilt a half mile away from its original location? Settle down. It's question two. It should be easy. Take your time. In 1872, which of these distilleries was rebuilt half a mile away from its original location? Was it A, Ben Romack, B, Loch Lomond, or C, Balblier? Still well over 300 of you in for the quiz at the end. I love it. Thank you for the company and thank you for participating and enjoying it. I noticed that we got way up into the high 300s tonight as well. It's always brilliant to have the support. Mark Lambert is saying how much yearbook content changes each year. For, to my eyes, almost all of it. Obviously, the stats and things like that tend to stay the same, but most of the entries in there, certainly in the Scotch section, Ingvar is writing new content every year. Uh, there's new uh, uh, editorial takes. Uh, there's always a new theme in the book. Uh, all the data is updated. It's just, 
It's fifteen pounds. <laughs> it's like the best value in whiskey. It genuinely is. Uh, most of you going for C, fantastic. Uh, ben Demon Hunter, good to have you. And he's saying it, another crowd follower C because you've got no clue, but good to follow the crowd if you're not very sure. Sometimes it works out. Watch out for the banana skins, though. Uh, but obviously, 1872, Ben Rowick, it tells you on the bottle it wasn't founded until 1898. Loch Lomond is a 1960s distillery, so it can only be Bal Blair. They're the only ones that existed. And in 1872, the original distillery was closed down and they moved it half a mile away. Still on the same estate, still under the same, the Ross family, famously the Rosses, who are still there today. Um, but I'm looking for C. Bal Blair. Well done, everybody. Question three. How long has Ben Romack been under the ownership of Gordon and McPhail? It's quite a big deal back in the time. It was way before I was into whiskey, but uh, an independent bottler buying a distillery was quite a move. Uh, so I've given you a bit of a clue there when I ask you how long Ben Romack has been under the ownership of Gordon and McPhail is A, 10 years, B, 20 years, or C, 30 years. We've got quite a flight in front of me tonight. Oh my goodness, I've just nosed the Anok. So lovely. This is a long morn. Still gorgeous. This is the Glen Goyne. Oh, that Dunnage thing is strong on the Glen Goyne, my goodness. And this wee Klein Leash. Ah, just terrific. Just terrific. You can see why you get nostalgic about these things. C, again, everybody seems to think that Ben Romack has been going for 30 years under the ownership of Gordon McPhail and absolutely spot on. It is three decades long. I don't know if they're planning anything special for their 30th year. You would think that they might, but perhaps not. Um, brilliant stuff. Rob Smith is a way to link with tasting. We'll need to catch the rest on replay. I hope it's great, Rob, and thanks for dropping by. Uh, well, you could. Question four, which of these age statements was once featured on a widespread core release from Ardbeg? One of these was a widespread core release from Ardbeg back in the, the nostalgic days. Was it A, Ardbeg 11-year-old, B, Ardbeg 15-year-old, C, Ardbeg 17-year-old? Michael would have saying the streak is over, two out of three, you slipped up already, stay with it, Michael, stay with it. You might end up doing really well. Roland Schwab is saying, oh hell, your quiz shows me every time how little I actually know about whiskey. Roland, hang about for long enough. It's weird how the, the community seems to just pick it up from each other. It's almost like they learn by osmosis. Um, don't worry about it. See, love what you, I see what you're doing, says Whiskey Wings. Well, you can continue to follow, follow that. Um, I put no thought into whether the answers come A, B or C. So if there's a lot of C's tonight, I assure you, my friend, it is absolutely coincidence, but absolutely. Uh, famously, Arbeck's 17-year-old. Um, it was brought out in the, the late 1990s as they were bringing Arbeck back, back to life, the 17-year-old. It lasted for quite a few years. And for a lot of people out there, it is the definitive Arbeck. You have to pay quite a lot of money for Arbeck 17 at auction now. It's not something uh, along the theme that we've been discussing tonight. It is one of those kind of... Uh, special bottles I guess but a lot of people speak very nostalgically eh, through misty eyes about Ardbeg 17. Question five is always the picture round. I'm showing you a picture of a distillery here. I think this is a genuine photograph. Photograph, sorry. It does look like an artist's impression but I think it's genuine and I'm just going to ask you what distillery are we looking at? Are we looking at something from Dornock in Scotland? Something from Stowning in Denmark or something from St. Killian in Germany? A. Dornock, B. Stowning, C. St. Killian. Oh my goodness, I have got lovely, lovely whiskies in front of me tonight. It's not all nostalgia, they're genuinely very good. <laughs> Hoyt Hemphill is in saying it might be chat GPT. Yeah, it might be. It might be one of those uh, uh, AI generated images from Midjourney or whatever image generator. 
But no, in fact, I've taken this. The credit is here from the distillery itself. I've taken this from their own website. Amazing virtual tour of this distillery, says Ben Whiskey with Molly. Amazing innovation. And we're talking about B. We're over in Denmark. This is a stunning distillery in Denmark. Uh, if you want to see their innovation, just look at how they're me they've mechanized the malting. Uh, they've got uh, automated floor maltings in the distillery there, which is super interesting. Uh, I've not tried their virtual tour. Uh, I didn't even know there was one there, so that's good information, Ben. And uh, aye, it might be something to uh, while away a wee bit of time. Although I'm so behind on things, I don't have much time <laughs> at the minute. Lots of five out of fives. We're in great shape. We're in great shape, not only for getting to some 10 out of 10s, but maybe for getting to some 10 out of 10s before the two-hour mark. I'm not rushing it tonight, but I did feel like this could be the night that we finally got a sub-two-hour VPUB. Question six, which of these Loch distilleries is not real? So two of the distilleries you're going to see are genuine distilleries that either have or do exist, and one of them I've invented. A, Fairy Lochen Distillery, B, the Black Loch Distillery, or C, Loch Hugh Distillery. Now, I kind of felt I maybe should have had a wee banana skin in here. I don't know. But two of these are genuine. A, Fairy Lochen Distillery, B, the Black Loch Distillery, or C, Loch Hugh Distillery. Michael Wood is four out of five. He's still going. You'll need one more, Michael. One more to get to the pass mark, and then you can relax for the second half. Rob Too Slow is in, and he's saying B. Falscraft is also saying B. Most of the crowd is saying B. Marco is, is asking, is it B? Whiskey and Wine Trails Toms is in and saying B as well. B, they all think that the Black Loch Distillery is made up. I can tell you that Loch U Distillery was once a distillery. It was a tiny, tiny distillery in the West Coast. Um, it was on the side, it was part of a hotel. And through a loophole, they had the smallest distills in Scotland. Tiny little distillery, only making a few casks a year. I believe they've long since closed. Um, Fairy Lochen is actually another Danish distillery. So the Black Loch distillery was absolutely invented. Lots of six out of six, doing very well. Question seven, which of these is true regarding Spey distillery and Kingusi? So there's going to be one true statement here and two false. Bit of a banana skin. Concentrate. This is, I think I could catch myself out on this. Which of these is true? Is it A, Spay will be forced to close in 2025? B, Spay makes the black whiskey coup duff, which is, uh, I think it's actually black dog and C uh, it took 35 years to build so which of those is correct about Spade Distillery it makes a black whiskey called Kudav it makes uh, sorry A it, it'll be forced to close in 2025 sorry or B it makes the black whiskey Kudav or C it took 35 years to build I think banana skins and the ass hats start to come in the second half of the quiz easy starting Justin Wan is saying, yeah, these banana skins are tough. So, Spade Distillery. Um, so, when I'm talking about Spade Distillery, I should specify the distillery itself is called Speyside. But just to be clear here, this is the distillery that makes Spay whiskey. So, it's Speyside Distillery. But what's going to happen? A, it'll be forced to close in 2025. It makes a black whiskey coup duff, or it took 35 years to build. I can tell you... It's splitting the crowd here. There's going to be a lot of people uh, slipping up on this wee banana skin here. Um, it didn't take 35 years to build. It took 28 years to build. It did take a long time. Uh, it did used to make the black whiskey, but it wasn't called Kuduff. The black whiskey that it made back in, or that it, I think it maybe still makes it, is called Bendu instead, but it's just heavily, heavily colored to be black. Um, but it will actually be forced to close in 2025. Their lease on that land runs out and they will have to move their distillery. Quite an incredible uh, set of circumstances. Opened in 1990. It's been going for 35 years. So there you go. A was the answer to that one. 
Question eight, what is peculiar about Macallan Distillery? Specifically, I'm speaking about the new distillery, the new Macallan. I want to ask you specifically what is peculiar about it. Again, we've got a true statement here and two not so true. I did lose a few people there. A, Macallan uses an efficient mash filter and hammer mill. B, Macallan does not have a spirit safe. Or C, it has a 50-50 split of steel and larch washbacks. What is peculiar about Macallan Distillery? It uses a mash filter and hammer mill. That would be instead of a, a mash tun. A, it's quite an interesting setup. Or B, it does not have a spirit safe. So a spirit safe is where you measure the uh, amount of uh, spirit being produced. It's all to do with the tax and uh, customs and excise. Or C, it has a 50-50 split of steel and large washbacks. This is a fermentation room we're talking about. Some distilleries use steel. Some distilleries use uh, various types of wood. Oregon pine, larch, various uh, types of wood. Uh, and some distilleries apparently would have a mix of both. So what are we talking about at Macallan? Waterford and Ireland have a mash filter too. Looks gnarly. Uh, that's Attic Drams. Good to have you in. Uh, I can tell you that Janinic also has a, a mash filter and hammer mill, as well as Inch Dearney. But Macallan does not. Neither does it have a 50-50 split of steel and latch washbacks. It's 100% steel, uh, but they do not have a spirit safe comes out the the spirits that I guess it just all must be through flow meters and various things like that, different way to measure yeah, the spirit being produced, but it just goes straight into a, a filling uh, or a pre-filling vessel, I would imagine. So there you go, it was B, McAllen does not have a spirit safe. Hell's Wind is on eight out of eight holding it together. <laughs> Dangarang says false graph. Tony Nelson is saying Kudov is born at the small Speyside distillery, located, yes, in Speyside. It is matured for five years, then shipped to Denmark, where it is caramel coloured to within an inch of its life. Uh, the small space side distillery located, yes, in space side. Uh, if they are exporting something called Kuduff in the UK, they call it Bendu. So there was another one uh, called a. Uh, Loch do as well. There's been three black distillery, uh, black whiskies. Kuduff was one. Uh, I'm sure Loch do. Yes, Loch do was the other one. And the more recent one is Ben do. These are all the same idea. They talk about using casks to color the whiskey, but actually they're just dosing it heavily with caramel color. It's sold at 40%. It's not good whiskey. You don't want to drink it. You don't need it as part of your collection. Get somebody to pour you a dram at a bar or Try it one day, but don't buy it. It's awful stuff, regardless of which uh, expression it is. Question nine. Which of these distilleries can be easily purchased and enjoyed in Asia, but very difficult to pre procure anywhere else? This is a bizarre thing where most of the product from that's made from that distillery, it's not distributed evenly across the world. It's just sent to one place. Pretty odd. I'm sure it makes sense to somebody somewhere. But are we talking about A, Diageo's Glenord? B, Shivas Brothers Strathila, or C, Inverhouse's Balminach. Which distillery is it very difficult to buy here, unless you actually go there, perhaps? Uh, but if you were in Asia, it's plentiful. Quite an easy one for question nine, I think. Enroll the answers. Justin Wan is saying, I thought a spirit safe was a legal requirement. Well, let's uh, say that just some way of measuring the spirit output is a legal requirement. I guess it doesn't have to be a glass and brass spirit safe, as it turns out. Easy this quiz, eh? Says Graham Fraser, talking to Blair Stevenson. Uh, good to see you both in. Brilliant stuff. Um, but aye, you've absolutely got this right. The penultimate, most of you have got this right. Uh, Diageo's Glenord is is under the Singleton brand and it's bizarrely split. We tend to get the Singleton of uh, Glendullen or Dufton here in Europe. Uh, I guess in North America it's slightly different, maybe Glendullen or Dufton. Uh, but the Singleton of uh, Glenord is what makes it 
almost exclu exclusively to Asia. A, I was looking for A. So how are we, before we hit the ass hat at the end, how are we doing for scores? Tony Nelson on an 8 out of 9. Peter Box on an 8 out of 9. I'm at 154. I might make this tonight. Whiskey and Wine Trails, Tom on 9 out of 9. Tommy Elmer on uh, 8 out of 9. Hellswood on 9 out of 9. There's, there's still quite a few 9 out of 9s here. A lot of 8s, a lot of 7s. Hopefully it's an achievable quiz. You've got five minutes, Roy Rick Johnson. <laughs> I'm not on time. Let's not sweat it. Let's not be stressed about the clock. It's the V-Pub, right? Let's just see where it finishes, Rick. Thanks, buddy. Um, so I let's keep our eye on those nine out of nines as we roll into the ass hat at the end. Did I keep the John Campbell ass hat here or did I change it? Let's have a wee look. No, this is an extra ass hat that I had from the John Campbell distillery a few weeks back. Uh, I never used this, I used a different one instead, so we'll use it tonight. John Campbell has worked at Laphroaig, Tormor, Tormor, Ardmore and Loch Lee. What is their combined annual capacity in million litres per annum? Is it about the same as A, the number of maturing casks in Scotland? Is that combined number about the same as B, the capacity of Diageo's Rosile? Or is that combined number about the same as C, the combined capacity of Distel's three distilleries? I could help you a little bit there and tell you that Distel's three distilleries are Bunahav and Tobermory and Deanston. So whatever the combined leaders, the ASAC question is always deliberately awkward, obtuse, horrible, difficult, hard. Half the time, I'm sure everyone is guessing, at least half the time. But it's meant, that it's meant to be there for that very reason. We've put it in at the end. It's the way the quiz has evolved. I know it's a deliberately awkward question, hence Jimmy Legg famously naming it the ASAC question. The combined capacity of Laphroaig, Tormor, Ardmore and Loch Lee is about the same as the number of maturing casks of whiskey in Scotland. B, the capacity of Diageo's single uh, Speyside distillery, Rosile or see the combined capacity of Distel's three distilleries. I can tell you that the number of maturing casks in Scotland is sitting at about 20 million casks. I can tell you that the capacity of Diageo's Rosile is about 12 to 13 million litres per annum. And I can tell you that see the combined capacity of Distel's three distilleries, it's pretty small, only about six and a half million litres per annum. I can tell you that the combined distillery of John Campbell's distilleries is around 13 million. So the answer is B. The ass hat question at the end is B, about the same as Rose Isle. Did anybody make it over the line? Rose Isle is huge, in it? Aye, not as big, grain of malt, as McAllen, Glenfiddich, or indeed Glen, Glenlivet. Glenlivet and Glenfiddich are the big malt distilleries now. Ailsa Bay as well is pretty massive now, down in the Lowlands, owned by William Grants. Delighted to have got the McAllen question wrong, says Tim Allott, and he's celebrating. <laughs> Terrific, Tim. <laughs> Brilliant stuff. What have we got? <laughs> Whiskey with Molly, 9 out of 10. Brilliant, Ben. It's superb. Ben Demon Hunter, 8. Malt Minion, 9. Andrew Pierce, 8. Jimmy Jazz, 8. Peter Box, 9. Nicholas, 8. Green of Malt saying yes. Gino Camo is saying 9. Nine uh, for Jimmy Leg. I'm looking for a ten. Oh no, Mark Carell is saying boo. Okay, I've just had a big jump. Jimmy Paul, Jimmy Paul is celebrating uh, a ten out of ten as is Sugar Kitty. Brilliant stuff. Hellswood is saying ten out of ten. Your beauty. So we've got multiple ten out of tens. That's a first time that's happened. Uh, it's not happened like that for a long, long time. Tremendous stuff. Hellswood, uh, Jimmy Paul, uh, Sugar Kitty celebrating their tens. Anybody else? I hope I don't miss anyone. How many minutes have I got left? One. <laughs> Jimmy Legg is saying Aquavidi. I think I called you an asset. I've just had some drums coming in, so let's grab these before we wind up for tonight. Uh, and I can tell you, oh, I don't want to miss these. Where is it? Uh, Hoy Hempel is saying celebration of new granddaughter. Oh, let's raise a glass to that. Tremendous. Here's a, wee, uh, a delicious uh, drama, Glenn Goyne. Hoy, congratulations to you, my friend. What wonderful news. Cheers. And I've missed another one. Or it's maybe stuck from earlier. I'm sorry if I've missed anybody's. It looks like it's, it's messing up a little bit. I've got a Jimmy Leg drum just come in just now there. Let's catch that. He's saying, I'll buy you this tram if you go past two hours. <laughs> Sorry, I've already got your money, big guy. Very generous tram as well, Jimmy Leg. Thank you very, very much. Cheers to you. 
thank you, Jimmy, for all your support. Check your email, buddy, because I did send you an email. Okay. It looks like we are going to roll past two hours, but that's okay. I can finish up now. I can raise this glass to you all and miss the eyed nostalgia for all the years and all the good times that we've had in the V-Pub and all the drams of whiskies that we've shared. And remember that I think the point of all of this tonight is that whiskey comes to you and we should always just be looking forward to creating the new events that's going to build up the nostalgia of the future rather than dwelling on the things of the past. I don't even think that makes much sense, but we'll go with it anyway. I'll raise this glass to remind you all that you're very dearly loved. Thank you very much for hanging out with me on another relaxed and easy Thursday night for me. Next week will be a completely different affair, much more stressful. I hope you'll join me there on the Isle of Rassi and uh, we'll try to bring a successful live stream on location. Thank you all for your support and I'll see you next week. Slanchova, everyone. Mm -hmm.